First off, I want to go ahead and introduce the two that are here with us, John Amakawa and Michelle Chin. Uh, so John is Associate Professor in Communications and Media and Game Design, the Game Design Program at Fitchburg State University in Massachusetts. He specializes in the creation of augmented reality mobile apps for historical landmarks through his design consultancy, Studio Amakawa. And recently he completed the Heart Mountain Augmented Reality mobile app. Uh, up at uh, the site where I'm the director, uh, Heart Mountain in Wyoming. And then Michelle Chin is a uh, senior producer of Kids Media and Education at the WNET Group, where she's been creating content for public television and digital platforms since 2004. She's received Emmy Awards for her work on the PBS Kids series, Cyber Chase, and the multi-platform project, Get the Math. She also serves as senior producer on the groundbreaking educational gaming series, Mission US, which is what she's going to be talking to us about today. All right, so as Dakota mentioned, um, I'm a senior producer with WNET, which is the flagship PBS station um, here in New York City. And I'm, first of all, I wanna thank Dakota for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, it's exciting to be part of this group because there's some really cool projects in this group aside from ours. Um, so I'm here to tell you about Mission US and um, a little bit about how we developed Prisoner in My Homeland. Um, so uh, Prisoner in My Homeland is the sixth game from Mission US, which is our award-winning series that we developed to engage young people in American history. And we began developing Mission US back in 2005 with the goal of getting young people to care about history by seeing it through the eyes of peers from the past. And since 2010, we've launched six games, each of them putting players in the role of a young person at a pivotal moment in US history. Um, and to date, we've had three and a half million students and over 100,000 teachers using the games to date across the country and um, some around the world. So in Prisoner in My Homeland, um, players step into the role of Henry Tanaka, a fictional Japanese American teenager whose family is forced to leave their home for uh, the military prison camp in Manzanar, California. Players grapple with challenges faced by the more, hundred, more than 120,000 Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated during World War II. And I'm going to attempt to play a video. The year is 1941. You are Henry Tanaka, a 16-year-old American citizen. But after the U.S. declares war on Japan, you are seen as the enemy. The government forces you and 120,000 other innocent Japanese Americans into prison camps. Will you help your community? Support the war? Resist injustice? When your loyalty is questioned, how will you respond? Mission U.S. Serious history, serious games. The year is 19... Sorry, I did not mean to do that. Let me... The year... There we go. Um, so, Prisoner in My Homeland, there was a quick glimpse at what it looked like. Um, we designed it for use in the classroom. So it's structured in five parts, um, each about 20 minutes or so uh, to make them easily integratable into classroom periods. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through what happens in the game. Um, at the start of the game, a young woman named Maya discovers her grandfather Henry's diary. Um, and as she reads the diary, she and the player are transported back in time to the year 1941, which is when Henry's story begins. Henry um, recounts how his parents immigrated from Japan and established a strawberry farm in Bainbridge Island, Washington. We learn that the farm was put in Henry's name because the discriminatory laws had not allowed his parents to own the land. Um, and in this pre-war scene, players' choices include whether to try out for baseball, study for a chemistry test, or attend his dad's judo class. But life quickly changes after Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. Um, the U.S. declares war and President Roosevelt issues Executive Order 9066. Um, Henry's father is questioned and arrested by the FBI. Um, and soon Henry, his mother, and his sister are forced to leave their farm and their dog behind and travel to Manzanar. The player as Henry must help his family adapt to life at the camp in creative ways, such as finding tin can lids to block the holes in the floorboards 
so the dust won't get in, um, and looking for Henry's sister when she goes missing. And it turns out that she went to wait for the buses that are arriving in the hopes that her dad might be on one of them. Um, Henry can also help his family by taking a job at the camp um, and also eventually can attend school when the school is finally built um, to, approve, to try to improve his prospects for attending college. Um, while completing tasks around Manzanar, the player interacts with other Japanese American characters who have a range of viewpoints and backgrounds. Um, so for example, there are peers like Tadashi, who's a rebellious teenager from Terminal Island, uh, Mako, who is a studious neighbor and a potential romantic interest for Henry. Um, there are adults like Mr. Yamamoto, who is actually Mako's father. Um, he's an active member of the JACL. Um, and the player also meets historical figure Harry Wayno and may be able to help him in his efforts to improve camp life. Um, during the game, the players interact with primary source materials from the time, including documents, photos, radio excerpts, and period music, and they will learn vocabulary by collecting smart words um, through um, a special system we have in the game. Um, as players make choices, they earn badges that help determine the outcome of Henry's story, and that also align with some of um, the larger themes, um, including strategies for coping with our incarceration. So for instance, if you decide to spend your earnings to purchase war bonds, you earn a point toward a duty calls badge um, for supporting the war effort, but there's also badges for, you know, putting your family first, there are badges for resisting and questioning authority, um, badges for trying to help your community, um, so different types of themes in the game. Um, as the game continues, Henry and the player learn about rising tensions in the camp that erupt in protest and violence. And in part three, Henry learns that he and other prisoners must complete the infamous loyalty questionnaire and players um, grapple with different perspectives on how to answer in particular those two key questions 27 and 28 uh, which as many of you probably already know are about your willingness to serve in the armed forces and your willingness to swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America. Um, this decision will impact the players potential paths which might include enlisting in the army uh, being deemed disloyal and sent away to Tule Lake, uh, attending college in the East, or returning to Bainbridge Island to help his parents resettle um, after the war. In the epilogue, the player learns about the family's experiences after incarceration and the history of the decades that followed, including the redress movement and the government's official apology um, in 1988. Um, so, I have been part of all the Mission US games from the very beginning, um, but this game in particular is near and dear to my heart. Um, my husband is Japanese American. His grandparents met and were married in camp. His mom was born in Topaz. Um, and I learned a great deal about the history through him, um, but it became clear when we were um, thinking about this game that the story was not widely known or covered in depth in many classrooms across the country. Um, and our, our research with students and teachers confirmed that there was a great need for materials to support teachers in including this content in the curriculum. So um, we were thrilled to receive funding from the National Park Service JAX program to create this game. Um, from the beginning, of course, um, we knew it was important to include members of the Japanese American community in uh, developing the game. We worked closely with advisors from the Bainbridge Island Japanese American community um, as well as advisors from Densho who provided critical input on the development of the game and resources. Uh, we also consulted with members of the Manzanar Committee and several historians and scholars, including Tetsuka Shima, Roger Daniels, Martha Nakagawa, um, Alan Austin. Um, and we also collaborated with Yuri Education Project, um, uh, which is an organi organization that focuses on developing curriculum through an Asian American lens. Um, to create a comprehensive educator's guide. Um, so creating a game designed to educate middle schoolers about these difficult, complex, and often sensitive um, topics comes with its unique challenges. Um, and the advisors, as well as our formative research with kids and teachers, helped guide us in navigating these challenges. Um, one challenge in all of our games is trying to find the right balance between making the game accessible and engaging while also making sure the content is appropriate for the audience. 
Um, so we definitely include, try to include engaging and relatable story elements like baseball games, dances, potential romances um, that are appealing to the age group. Um, but then we are also very careful when we're portraying things like violence. Um, care we're careful to, pro to try to convey them in a way that's age appropriate. And the most extreme or violence, uh, most extreme violence, um, we reveal it to the player usually only through dialogue or through non-interactive animations to lessen the potential for trauma. Um, another challenge is finding a balance between historical accuracy and good storytelling. Um, we spend many hours discussing and debating these things with our team and with our advisors. Um, so one example um, is that we decided to give Henry and the player the option to answer no, no on the loyalty questionnaire. Um, our advisors uh, and our research told us that in reality, no one from Bainbridge Island actually answered no, no. Um, so it would not have been historically accurate for someone like Henry to, to do so. But we wanted to provide the players with agency and the freedom to think through the issues for themselves. Um, and in the end, our advisors agreed that in the context of the game, this option should still be on the table as it would have been in real life. Um, another challenge specific to this game was how do you handle um, language and accents? We knew that Henry's parents, like most of the Issei in the camps, would have been speaking Japanese pretty much all the time. Um, but for the sake of accessibility um, and comprehensibility, since this game was really designed for English, primarily English speaking teenagers across the country, uh, we made the decision to have all the VO um, and text presented in English. Um, and we included little captions that indicated when the dialogue was actually being spoken in Japanese. We're just hearing it in English, but it, the idea is that they're actually speaking Japanese. Um, we also tried to strike a careful balance with the use of accents um, to try to balance cultural sensitivity and also try to avoid you know, harmful stereotypes. Um, so there were accents in the game, but they were kind of light accents. Um, and another thing that is specific to this game is making careful choices about the use of, of historical terms versus current terminology. Um, although at the time of the game, the word internment was commonly used and in fact is still very widely used. Um, we knew from advisor feedback that it was important to call out the use of that term as being inaccurate and euphemistic. Um, so we tried to walk a careful line in how we used words like that in the game. Um, so, for example, with this word, what we ended up doing was uh, to have Maya, the current day granddaughter, point out in her narration that they falsely called it internment rather than what it was, um, the mass imprisonment of American citizens based on fear. Um, and then we also included um, some materials in the educator guide to further explore this. Um, Across all our games, um, we try to um, go by this, um, this idea that each mission tells a story. It's not the story or the entire story um, because each mission highlights the experiences of one individual as well as the selected group of characters that they interact with in the game. The mission cannot claim to capture every perspective or you know, the, the entire story on the, that given historical moment. So instead, we think of the game experience as um, something to spark interest in the past and provide a jumping off point for further discussion and exploration in the classroom. So to this end, we knew it was also important to provide supports for teachers using the game with their students. Um, so our educator guide includes background information, activities, primary sources, standards alignments, and additional media resources. Um, the goal is to promote further discussion about the broader social, political, and economic context of the events in the game and help young people make connections to larger historical themes that remain relevant today. Um, we strongly believe that it's critical to teach young people about the past in order to empower them with the understanding and knowledge to improve their present, and especially, it's especially critical for understanding longer-term struggles for justice and inequality that continue to today. And I just want to uh, end with a quote from one of our advisors from Bainbridge Island, Lily Kodama. Um, after she played the game, she, she emailed um, us about it. And I'll just read it quickly. Um, 
She said, I'm 86, year old, 86 years old and have lived the games event. I played it with my 17 year old granddaughter. We were both quite impressed with how well all events were covered in a way that young people can learn this part of rarely told American history in an easy and enjoyable way. This is so important for all to know how righteous movement, righteous governments and people can make wrong dishonorable decisions based on fear and poor leadership. I do not want this to happen again to any other group. Um, so this sums up a lot of, you know, our motivation for creating the game and why we're so pleased that, you know, people have been able to play it and share it with their families. Um, and if you do play the game, you may notice that there's a character named Lily um, and we did partially base it on her and her personal story. Um, and I just wanna give a quick shout out to our partners. EDC conducted all of our formative and a formative research. They also do summative research on our games. The American Social History Project led content development and Electric Fun Stuff are our game developers. Um, and of course, a big thank you to all of our funders, especially the National Park Service. Um, and here's where you can find the game and find us on social media. So that's Mission US Prison in my homeland. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. For those of you who have not played it yet, the game is is fantastic and just a, a, a wonderful treatment of it. And um, we'll come back to Michelle later with some questions. In the meantime, if you do have questions for her, go ahead and put them in the Q&A right now. And uh, here at the end of the program, after we've seen John and, and Angie's presentations, we'll, we'll revisit that. But uh, I encourage everybody, I dropped the, the link to the game in the chat there to uh, take some time uh, this evening and, and play through it because it, it really is very well done. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. Um, John, would you like me to share your slides or, or let, have you let me give it, it Let me give it one more go. And sure. if it doesn't, um, oh, yes, I think I should be okay. Okay, can you see? Yep. All right. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, first of all, hello. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna present to you a new mobile app that I created for Heart Mountain that makes use of a new interpretive approach called augmented reality or AR. Uh, it is something that has really only become possible in the past eight to 10 years with the advent of smartphones. So the Heart Mountain AR is an augmented reality app uh, for Heart Mountain World War II Japanese American uh, confinement site. It's available for free for iOS on Apple's App Store and for Android on Google Play. Um, and we just published it uh, before the Heart Mountain pilgrimage in July, 2021. So the idea is visitors install the app on their mobile devices at the interpretive center um, and the app is intended to enhance the in-person experience at the site. The, uh, the mobile app works with special signage that triggers the augmented reality content. So uh, what you see here is just is one of the signs, um, actually the first one right outside the visitor center. And um, OK, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you a, uh, a screen recording from my my phone in using it. Um, so, you know, you start up the app. And what happens is the uh, <clears throat> the camera of the uh, uh, mobile device is turned on and the visitor is prompted to uh, center one of the virtual guideposts in the box. Now, um, well, so let me show you. Welcome to Heart Mountain. I'm Takashi Oshizaki. As a boy, I was incarcerated here along with over 10,000 other Japanese Americans during World War II. My family and I were forced to leave our home in California. We spent three and a half years of our lives here until 1945 when the government announced the closing of all camps. Okay, so I'm gonna pause this for a second. So basically augmented reality is really innovative because it allows us to display 
uh, 3D virtual reality motion graphics onto the real world to exact scale and location. So um, the sign that you saw was used to establish the user's position and to subsequently position the AR graphics. Um, so when I say 3D virtual reality motion graphics, I mean uh, the same kind you see in, for example, commercial video games. And AR essentially allows us to embed sound and imagery in the landscape and more fully utilize the power of place in the visitor experience. So, um, you know, you can see here the, the, the uh, virtual avatar of uh, Takashi Hoshizaki, and he is overlaid in real time on the actual landscape um, and sort of kind of combines, it, it combines both. Um, so there are currently 16 AR guidepost signs located throughout the site now. And I have a, a close up here. This is a, a, a close up of the, um, with the locations of the different signs. So you see the basic um, uh, grounds of uh, the um, Heart Mountain uh, historical site. And, uh, and you can see here, um, there's like a red line that shows you uh, the suggested uh, path that visitors can take. And, you know, we spent uh, a decent amount of time figuring out uh, one that would that might work well. Um, and uh, they also we also clustered them. So for example, on the left side of the screen, you'll see uh, a bunch of, of guide posts that are located around the honor roll. Um, and then on the right side, you'll see uh, a bunch uh, by the barracks. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that Heart Mountain, um, one of the issues at Heart Mountain, and I think probably similar to other confinement sites, is that you have this sprawling large site, right, that visitors um, are, uh, you know, uh, traversed through. So I'm going to show you now an, uh, some of the other guidepost sign. This one is up by the um, uh, the honor roll. And um, this is about uh, football and the Heart Mountain Eagles football team. They probably couldn't play their best game because they would come to camp and the fans circling the field were all Japanese faces. <laughs> They couldn't imagine that we know how to play football because most of the people thought that we were really Japanese. You know, they were totally amazed that she said, "I didn't know Japanese play no knew how to play football." <laughs> So you can see here in, in that example, right? The again, the, the landscape is there, um, but then overlaid on that, you can see the camp buildings are are placed. Um, and then, of course, also the football players. Um, <clears throat> you know, these virtual objects, one thing to keep in mind also is these, vir uh, these virtual objects, as you see, actually occupy uh, space. And it's conceivable in the future with, you know, with uh, better tracking devices, say, for example, like AR glasses, visitors could actually walk around the virtual buildings and, and you know, step inside buildings, interact with the virtual um, so I have some other examples. This one I captured at a different time of day, and this uh, was about Obon. Uh, one thing I want to point out is in a couple of the, the next two ones, at some points it's a little choppy um, with the animation. That really has more to do with the uh, recording this while the app was running, but it's actually when you're, when you're using the app on site, it, it's, it's quite smooth. So you can see me walking over. You can see two guideposts here. So this is a, uh, another one here. And uh, this is another one um, about the Boy Scouts Norman Owl. We had a troop in in uh, Heart Mountain, and we'd have our own jamboree within the camp, and our scout leaders would ride right to the Boy Scouts in Ralston, Deaver, Powell, Cody, saying, come on in and join us for our um, jamboree. 
Uh, thank you for the invitation, but barbed wire all around that camp and their military guard towers with searchlights and machine guns, uh, we're not going in there. Those are POWs. So finally, a, a Boy Scout troop from Cody came in. So we did our knot tying contest and woodworking contest and all the things, how to start a fire without a match and all the things Boy Scouts do. And then we got paired off with a kid from the Cody troop to put up our tent. I got paired off with this kid. And in Wyoming, it could rain any time and a lot. So you have to build a moat around your tent. So we built our moat. And then he said, there's a kid from my troop in the tent below us. I don't really care for it. Would you mind if you, we cut the water to exit that way if in case it rains? <laughs> no skin off my nose. So I said, sure. So we built this beautiful moat and cut the exit to water exit that way. And as luck would have it, it started raining. And our moat worked perfectly and the water drained down that way. Pretty soon the tent pegs on that tent went down and the tent came down. Kids in my tent going, ha, 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 he, 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 ho, ho, just laughing. And that was Alan Simpson. So, um, so for the AR app, I attempted to recreate uh, what can no longer be seen at Heart Mountain, such as the camp buildings and infrastructure. Um, each guidepost tells a different personal story or presents a different aspect of camp life. Um, many of the stories feature the voices of incarcerees. So uh, you heard just before um, the voice of Norman Mineta. Um, all 3D animated people, buildings, and objects are original recreations. In addition to motion capture, in addition, motion capture was used for uh, for most character motions. Um, and in order to recreate the stories, I worked from an extensive collection of source images. Uh, when possible, the AR displays animations in their original locations. So, um, so in this next example, uh, we have another guidepost down by the railroad tracks and um, deals with both the arrival, one deals with the arrival of incarcerees and um, then the departure. And we place the, um, the train right over the railroad track, uh, where the railroad would have been. So you see the railroad tracks in the background, but there would have, there, the, um, there would have been another set of tracks uh, more in the foreground. And so you'll see that here. Okay. And then we walk over to uh, the second guidepost about the departure. My dad picked up a GI who was hitchhiking, and that wasn't unusual for that time. But uh, he uh, said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but the last train leaves the camp tomorrow. So my dad took my sister and I and mom, and we came out to watch. We got out of school. So I'm just going to um, pause that here. So, I, you know, you'll notice uh, when we're seeing this, that at the same time, we're seeing the real landscape and see cars going by. I think there's something to be said about, again, about uh, bringing this history to the actual, to, to the place. And, um, you know, and the fact that this, this really did happen at this, um, this site. Um, I have here just a, a, some, some of the, a few examples of some of the source images that I used. Uh, I really kind of uh, relied on an extensive um, array of um, uh, sources from any, anything from artwork to uh, photographs at Heart Mountain. Um, you can see, for example, the Boy Scouts um, you know, I'm using that for their, um, their uniforms. In the bottom corner, left corner, you'll see uh, women in kimono. Um, actually, I used those uh, uh, patterns, kimono patterns, for the women in the Obon um, uh, guidepost animation that you saw just earlier. Um, the AR app includes a map feature that enables visitors to view guidepost locations and plan their walking tour. All of the animations can be viewed in a non-AR format via the map, so this allows people who are not at Heart Mountain to view the app content. So I have here um, just a uh, recording showing this, uh, this map mode. So you can zoom in and then it shows you the locations of the guideposts so that people can, again, plan their route while they're there. 
but this also allows access to non AR versions of uh, of all of the animations. So you'll see in just a moment, there's an animation on uh, the swimming hole. I like to talk about the swimming hole. It was a wonderful experience. Of course, the swimming hole was really the irrigation water that came into the swimming hole, two diving boards, one high and one springboard. And they had a rope distinguishing those that cannot swim and those that could swim. And for many of us, we went from pier to pier, back and forth, and trying to figure out how to count. And we noticed the type of swimmers. If they were for older people, they did the side stroke or the breast stroke. And the more modern people did the Australian crawl or the backstroke. One of the things that we noticed when we got out of the swimming hole, it was cold. So they had a lot of little small campfires and we would go there to warm up. But before we left for the swimming pool, we would always go to the mess hall and ask the cook, could we have a potato? And they would hand us a potato. We would go to the swimming hole, we would get the mud from the bottom of the swimming hole, wrap it around the potato and put it into the fire. And before we left, we get a little stick, pull out the potato, peel off the mud. And that was one of the most delicious potatoes you could ever eat. Um, so three of the guideposts are actually located inside a barrack, the one uh, original barrack that is at Heart Mountain. Um, so this is an example of one of them. And this, this shows uh, making mochi. And uh, you can see the, the barrack, which currently is empty, uh, the real barrack in the background, and then the, uh, the people obviously are, are uh, animated. Now, all of the app content um, can be revised and expanded on. And I say this because, you know, one of the things I've really enjoyed about this project is working with the incarcerees, getting their feedback. And I thought I'd end with this anecdote about creating one particular story. Um, this, is, this is just uh, when I was developing uh, the story for, um, on Sam Mihara and his father who went blind in the camp. For, uh, from not getting uh, proper medical care. And uh, so I animated him, you know, guiding his, his father to and from the hospital. And I was able to actually sh uh, show this to Sam um, in the, uh, this year's pilgrimage. And he said, you know, that's, oh, I, you know, that, that's good and all. Uh, however, that's, that's not how we walked. Um, that's not how I walk with my father. And so Sam then showed me together with another incarcerated apprentice Uchida, how he would have walked with his father. And, and he, you know, he said his father uh, asked him to be almost like a blocker, right? So he would be out in front. And so then I went back and I uh, revised that. My and so, father had a case called glaucoma, glaucoma of the eyes. Before he went to camp in San Francisco, he was being treated by a special... So you can see... Um, you know, I was able to use that information in order to to improve on it. And um, so, you know, in closing, I would say um, this approach can absolutely be used at other confinement sites which face the same interpretive challenges. In fact, um, before doing this, I first applied this, um, this, this approach for um, African-American sites um, involving the Underground Railroad and slavery, which have very similar situation uh, where there's a lack of extant uh, things, but this important history to tell. Um, I think we have a unique opportunity to work with incarcerates to tell these kinds of stories, uh, but that window of time is obviously limited. Um, and... Uh, yeah, uh, that's the Heart Mountain uh, mobile app, AR mobile app. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. And I, I should say that obviously it looks amazing on the screen, but uh, <laughs> it, it really looks even better when you uh, can actually experience it in person at the site. Uh, it's really, really stupendous to uh, be able to sort of see the characters interact with the landscape itself. And as John said, you know, being able to 
uh, pick pieces of the uh, things that are happening around you in the 21st century, like the cars going by or things like that with, uh, and, and uh, see them intertwined with what's happening in the 1940s really produces kind of an interesting effect in your brain, I think, as, as you're watching it unfold there. Uh, so the last one that I wanted to share, I mentioned one of our panelists, uh, unfortunately, could not join us in person today. And uh, she asked me to uh, share a short video about her project with you, but just to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Angie Payne is a researcher at the Center for Advanced Spatial Technologies at the University of Arkansas. She specializes in digital heritage applications, which includes 3D modeling of historic sites, 3D documentation of artifacts and landscapes, and mapping up applications related to history and archaeology. She works on a variety of projects across the country. However, for this particular uh, project that she wanted to talk about today, this is related to something right in Arkansas, uh, the camps at Jerome and Rower, and uh, related specifically to uh, a interactive uh, 3D model, uh, sort of a the virtual tour of Rower, of Aurora block that they created uh, that's part of a project called Rising Above. So I'm going to put on her video and uh, let her tell you about that herself. Uh, the first couple of minutes will be silent and just a walk through and then Angie will pick up after about two minutes or so uh, with, with speaking. So don't worry if you don't hear anything at first. Uh, well, they started to screw immediately. <clears throat> we were one of the earlier ones there, so they were still uh, constructing barracks when we got there. Mm -hmm. And so they were working, and uh, 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 there's another thing that every once in a while when I go uh, camping, or, no, I don't go camping that often, but when we go to the forest, and you smell that, that burning of the leaves or the branches, mm -hmm. that brings back memories of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, my name is Angie and I'm joined today with Kimball Erdman and we're from the University of Arkansas. We wanted to open our presentation with a video of the first person walkthrough and experience of the 3D visualization of a barracks block at Rower. We wanted to provide you all with a sense of what the visualization looks like to then lead into some of the discussion about methods and decisions that were used to create the visualization. This work was completed as part of the Rising Above project. We'll take just a few minutes at the end of our presentation to discuss some of the other project elements as well. Let's get started. Rower Reconstructed began in 2013. However, Kimball has been working at Rower for over a decade and has conducted a considerable amount of research concerning the Rower Cemetery. In our early discussions about the project, we learned that there were a wealth of materials preserved in Arkansas collections and institutions that were specific to Rower and Jerome. Many of these materials are completely unique as they have been contributed by camp administrators and personnel. The image that you see on screen is one such example and is a pastel drawing on denim that was preserved by the art teacher, Jamie Vogel. Rower is a tiny community in the Arkansas Delta and it's located about 15 minutes northeast of McGee. The sister camp of Jerome, you can see, is located about 10 minutes to the southwest. Both of these camps are in a very rural part of our state. 
If you were to visit Rower today, very little of the camp remains. The cemetery marks the southern edge of the camp. And if you're standing in the cemetery, you can actually see the smokestack off in the distance from where the, where the hospital once stood. This smokestack marks the northern perimeter. These are the two primary landmarks that you see on the ground if you were to visit Rower today. However, from an aerial perspective, if we overlay a map of the camp, you can start to see more remnant features pop out across the landscape. Because there is very little physical evidence of rower today, and the majority of the land has returned to farming and is privately owned, this makes rower a good candidate for a 3D visualization. We decided to focus our visualization on block 12 at rower because we knew from the evidence that block 12 was partially wooded and partially cleared. If you look at many of the photos from both Rower and Jerome, you'll see a stark contrast between the residential blocks that were wooded and the residential blocks that were cleared. In efforts to try and convey the feeling of both residential types, we positioned the visualization in block 12. Realistically, we do not have enough historic evidence to completely reconstruct one barracks block exactly as it would have looked like. So instead, we compiled all of the photos that we had from all of the different blocks across Rower and used that to create a visualization of what we would call a typical barracks block. While we would have loved to have tried to reconstruct the entire camp, we decided to focus on a single residential block and reconstruct that block to the best of our ability. To begin the process, Kimball and his students mined all of the material that they could find relating to Rower from different online collections. These included collections at JARDA, Densho, JANM, and more. They used this information to create a highly detailed two-dimensional CAD model of what Block 12 could have looked like. All of the information that you see in this CAD model is supported by some form of primary document. Myself and the project team at CAST then began the process of translating that 2D information into 3D building models. One of the primary sources that we used to do that were these construction drawings that were created by the WRA whenever the camp was built. These provided the exact dimensions of all of the buildings, both inside and out. In addition to building details, we also have details for the entire camp that include where the sanitary sewer system was as well as the overhead electrical system. So the power lines and power poles that you see in the visualization are accurate based on the information provided in these drawings. We then had to take these perfect building models and make them look not so perfect. We wanted them to look like they were lived in because the time period of our visualization was the summer of 1944. We chose the summer of 44 because it was considered to be the peak period of occupation before internees started to leave and before the camp started to look overgrown. So we had to cut holes in the buildings where internees had cut holes in the buildings to make back doors for ventilation and for access to their backyards. We had to add awnings, porches, boardwalks, trellises, and a considerable amount of vegetation, much of which was added for shade and cooling. The results of version one of the visualization can be seen in front of you. The source image is one that you see here. So you can see we kind of got it pretty close. Luckily, we were able to return to the visualization with a second round of funding and were able to refine the visualization even more. We were able to add audio and video segments from incarcerees and we were able to improve the visualization based on incarceree feedback that we received by attending one of the pilgrimages in Arkansas. The final visualization of which you guys saw a quick video of at the beginning of this presentation is available on the Rower Reconstructed website located at risingabove.cast.uark.edu. This site is actively changing as we are currently uploading new materials to the site related to Jerome. So this homepage is likely going to change considerably over the course of the next year. The primary components of the site, however, will stay the same. The project archive currently features up to 2,000 items related to experiences at both Rower and Jerome. The interactive timeline covers over 150 years of history, 
leading up to the Japanese American incarceration in World War II all the way through till today. The 3D visualization of block 12 is part of a series of other visualizations that are available on the site. In addition to the visualization, which you can access through the explore option, there are a series of interactive maps and a connections graph that shows the connection between people at Rower and items in the archive. Here's just a few examples of some items in the archive. In this slide, I'd like to highlight the importance of metadata for providing the what, when, where, and why about these items. It's also essential for allowing us to sort and filter through items in the archive, particularly when we start to get a large number of items. All of the documents also feature full transcriptions, which are also fully searchable. One of the more unique features of the archive is the ability to view all of the items associated with an individual. So in cases where we knew the names of individuals and, the pho and photographs, or where we have um, letters written between individuals, all of those names have been preserved. You're then able to select an individual and see all of the items in the archive pertaining to that individual. In addition to names, there are a number of other filter options available. Being able to filter by time is a unique option that is handy when you're searching for items that span nearly a hundred year history. You can sort by different item types, by collection name, by camp, et cetera. The connections graph also provides a unique opportunity for seeing relationships between the people that are preserved in the documents and the documents themselves. So in this graph, individuals are listed as blue nodes and all of the items in the archive are color coded with an individual color. In this example, we can see that Richard Yada has a number of items associated with him on the left-hand side. We can then hover over those items in particular and see other individuals that are associated with those items. We also have a series of interactive maps these maps are currently being updated to add new material for Jerome, and we're very excited to add more interactive and clickable features. So in this particular example, whenever you select the train ride from Santa Anita to Rower, we'll, we'll have more primary source documentation and accounts that talk about that train ride. The timeline is currently also being overhauled, and we're moving a lot of this information into the maps and the timeline will instead serve as a more general timeline with major events beginning in 1850 and going all the way through till today. The Rising Above project is the result of three awards from the Japanese American Confinement Sites Program and from contributions from a number of Arkansas institutions. We are very excited to be expanding this site to add materials for Jerome in hopes of creating a fairly comprehensive resource of Arkansas-based collections now fully digital and available online. Thank you. Uh, fantastic presentation by Angie and really just a fantastic uh, website. I'll drop the link into the, the chat in just a moment so uh, everyone can visit it, but I definitely encourage you to do is spend a little time clicking around and in addition to just being a wonderful sort of online archive that is intuitive in all sorts of ways that, that you might not necessarily think of an archive being. Um, you know, the visualization of uh, the rower block 12 that they've done is is just amazing. And, and really within a digital space gives you a real feeling for uh, how it must have been in the camp, which is so uh, uh, geographically different than the camps out west. It's always surprising to me to see how green it is in the camp in Arkansas there. And uh, uh, just just a really, uh, really interesting project there. Um, I do know that we have a lot of questions starting to come in through the chat here, and I have a few for you guys myself, um, and we have uh, some time to answer them. So I'm going to go ahead and start throwing out some to you guys. Uh, first one that we've got comes in from Sandy, and it's for Michelle. Uh, she asks, approximately how many students have played uh, your game? Uh, and she goes on to say that it looks fabulous and she's impressed that it tackles some complicated issues and wonders what feedback you've gotten from the students who played.
I thought I was unmuted, but I, I wasn't. Um, so uh, I our analytics indicate we've had about 180,000 unique um, visits to the game. So we, we believe it's about 180,000 students and teachers who have played over the past year. It launched um, in the fall of 2020. Um, and we've, you know, the feedback so far has been very positive. Um, we've heard from, you know, a number of students who are simply just grateful to us because their, their families were um, in the camps and they, they wanted to thank us for making this game, um, as well as, you know, students who generally enjoyed it and were, you know, glad to learn about this history that they didn't know about before. Um, we have not had a lot of chance to do a lot of um, summative research, but we did do some formative testing during um, development of the game. And, you know, in those tests, the, the students were all very positive. The engagement seemed very high. Um, they said they enjoyed seeing the story from the point of view of Henry. Um, and what was really heartening to us was also um, the, the, the responses we got from the students in the tests indicated that the game really got them to think about these issues in a nuanced way. So for instance, we, we asked kids to answer this question, would you enlist after, you know, if you were Henry? Um, and we got a variety of responses that were pretty thoughtful. You know, they, they had different reasons for what their answers, they, they, they talked about wanting to pr prove their support for America, but also thinking that, you know, but, but they put us here, so why should we want to fight? You know, so they, they had some fairly, you know, nuanced um, answers. And so that really indicated to, the, to us that the game was accomplishing what we wanted, was, which was to get kids to think about these complicated issues and to, to provide a jumping off point for them to have more sophisticated discussions. Did I answer all of your questions? I hope so. <laughs> we got it all. Thank you, Michelle. Right. Um, John, the next one's for you. Um, I'm going to combine two of them, one from one from David and one from uh, uh, Ed here. Um, the first one was a question of, uh, you know, length of time people are spending with this experience. How long does it take to go through all 16 augmented reality locations at Heart Mountain? And the second one being a little more technical in its nature. Um, how often do you have to update the app so that it works with software updates on Apple and Android phones? Okay, that's a good question. Um, okay, so in terms of the length of time, um, well, that's a little bit uh, hard to, for in terms of like a straightforward answer because of the distance between some of the different um, areas. It really depends on how long it will take for somebody to to get, for example, from the visitor center up to the um, the honor roll. Um, if they drive, that could be um, you know just a couple minutes. But if they walk, that could be um, fifteen minutes. Uh, I know when we when we originally designed the um, each of the guideposts, um, we were thinking um, to find kind of a sweet spot of um, uh, still substantive. Uh, you know, uh, but not too long. Um, and so I think we were aiming for somewhere around three minutes or so. Um, so I would say <clears throat> probably all together, uh, if somebody wanted to visit all the different sites um, during their uh, visit to Heart Mountain, probably about 15, uh, I'm sorry, 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, I think the, the, the thinking also is that they would, they, would tour, they would initially go to the visitor's center or, uh, and see the exhibits there. And then when they were actually touring the ground, um, use the, uh, the app. In terms of the, uh, the technical, um, so the, the, the app was really just launched only a couple months ago in July. So uh, since then, there, ha there haven't been any um, required updates. I think the, the biggest issue is probably is not so much um, updates for the app once the app is on um, a user's phone, but in subsequent updates of the app itself on the App Store. Um, there are uh, um, definitely a number of um, uh, 
things that need to be um, um, edited. And, and, and so that, that's kind of where, where more of the complexity there. One thing I can say is actually um, compared to some of the earlier um, uh, augmented reality apps, the Heart Mountain one was actually um, a kind of a big jump in terms of um, uh, the 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 um, what should I say the uh, the quality of the AR itself and the stability of it. We originally I used uh, something called Vuforia, which was a plugin in the uh, Unity game engine, uh, in order to uh, do the kind of image recognition for the signs that brought up the AR. Uh, and I switched to AR Core, which has allowed much more kind of free movement. So whereas before you needed to have the sign uh, visible in order to see the, um, the animations, um, now with this new version of Heart Mountain, you, you, you look at the sign, it recognizes it, the augmented reality graphics appear, and then you can actually walk around and it keeps them in place. So that's like a huge jump. Um, so hope that answers your question. And in fact, we've got a follow-up question coming in, John, uh, from Christine, and and uh, it it actually ties into a question that I wanted you to uh, comment on a little bit too, because I know this uh, kind of affected as we were developing the app and the storyline and the kind of stories we wanted to tell with it. So Christine's question initially is, how is cell phone reception at Heart Mountain? And how did that affect the development of the app? But um, I want you to speak a little bit larger than that as well. You know, as we have learned in this session quite recently, you know, technology can have its limitations. And that is something we had to design around a little bit that affected the flow of how we did things at Art Mountain. You know, how did that change the approach that you took? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, so uh, first off, actually the app doesn't, once you've installed the app, onto your device. It doesn't require um, cell phone reception or Wi-Fi reception um, at all. Uh, so, and that's that's kind of a big advantage um, uh, in some places, actually not Heart Mountain because Heart Mountain does have um, decent reception out there, but um, but the, the app works all locally, right? So um, it, it, it recognizes, it uses, the um, image recognition for each of the signs, each sign, each of the 16 signs is, um, is distinctive and uh, is recognized separately. So, um, so it has the advantage that, that um, it's, it can be completely um, independent of and, and operating just locally on your device. It uses that um, uh, recognition of the image to bring up all the content, but otherwise that all just resides on the phone. Um, the main thing for having a uh, uh, decent reception or Wi-Fi is just to initially install the app onto your device. And uh, so we try and kind of put information out about the app down at the visitor center where uh, uh, visitors can have Wi-Fi. So. Excellent. Thanks, John. So, Michelle, next I've got a question for you. Um, you know, your project is a little different than the others that we saw um, where, you know, in Heart Mountain and Rover, you're kind of a fly on the wall, sort of watching things unfold. Your story has sort of a main character who has agency, who, who makes choices, this player character. And how did that affect the way that you uh, relayed this history? And how also uh, was it, what were the challenges that came with that kind of agency? Um, very good question. Um, so I'd say one of the reasons we decided to create games like this in the first place is that we felt that putting, putting young people in the, in the role and giving them choices and the ability to kind of explore, um, meet people and, and feel like they were, you know, they were there was a big reason that the games, um, are so effective. You know, they really get kids to really um, engage from the content, feel kind of, um, feel like they, they, it really matters to them. Um, so I think that really was a big motivation for us to even, you know, use this format in the first place. Um, of course, you know, one of the big challenges is that, you know, this is one character and there were so many different stories, so many different perspectives and, and ways that this character could have gone. So 
it was a challenge to kind of um, think about how to create this character so that it was realistic, you know, it was faithful to the stories of um, someone, the story of someone who would, would have come from Bainbridge Island, um, would have been in this um, situation, um, but also provide enough options that the that the player feels like they have some agency. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a balance, you know, we want to provide, you know, enough information that it feels like a real character, um, you know, they have a background, they have certain motivations, but the, char the player also has the freedom to make certain choices to rebel if they want to. Um, so that was, you know, as I mentioned, a constant kind of push and pull, working with the advisors to kind of think about what would have been, you know, within the realm of possibility, you know, also, you know, things like how did, how does he speak to his mother? You know, you know, we, we pretty much kept the tone respectful, but, you know, I could imagine a, you know, a teenager today would would, you know, if we gave them the option to, to be completely disrespectful, I'm sure there's plenty of teenagers who would choose that option. So we also had to kind of um, think about choices like that. Um, and I would say also, um, you know, wanting to give them, you know, enough that they feel like um, it feels real and it feels like it, you know, they, they feel invested in it, but also there's that challenge of not wanting it to feel so real that it would be traumatic, you know? And I think in this format, um, I think the fact that it's not, it's not VR, you're not like, it's not total sensory immersion that I think that helps actually to, to provide a little bit of distance so that, you know, um, hopefully we, and, you know, we have, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of making it, you know, allowing um, students to feel the impact, the you know, potential emotional impact without making it so overpowering that they, you know, they, they could feel trauma about this, being in the situation. So those are just a few, a few things that come to mind. Thanks so much, Michelle. That's a great answer. And, and you know, um, uh, it's, it's something that, that I'm always thinking about and could probably discuss forever there. Uh, you know, uh, related to that, a question for both of you, I suppose, uh, coming into here is that obviously, in a sense, you're creating a narrative here. Um, you know, even if you're setting out to, you know, relay things as informationally as as possible, um, you know, which is very much the case with with say um, uh, the project in Arkansas. There, you know, it's very informational, but there is a narrative in the sense that. They are choosing what stories to tell and what they are going to uh, try and reflect, and that means there's stuff that you're going to leave out. That means that, you know, there's stuff that you're going to streamline to sort of get the the uh, point across there. And um, you know, I'm, I wonder how, as you were approaching these projects, did you decide, okay, this is what we're going to prioritize, and this is. Is, is something that we can leave out where the things that got left on the cutting room floor that you really wish could have gotten into there. Um, and so just talk a little bit about what that uh, sort of creative process was like. Um, and we'll start with John and, and, and then Michelle, I'd like you to weigh in on this as well. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, no, that's, that's, that's uh, incredibly important because um, you're, you know, we're, we're, of course we're making decisions about what to, uh, put in and leave out. There's a, we only have a limited amount of time and resources in order to tell this story. Um, I think one of the advantages with digital media, though, is that we can add to it, edit it, and revise it as we go on. Um, I think, you know, for, for me and my project, um, uh, collaborating with you, Dakota, and also Callie, um, it was incredibly important um, in, you know, trying to kind of figure out and prioritize what were those because there were so there's so many personal stories right um you know on the one hand we're trying to kind of tell personal stories but we also are trying to tell this larger story and i think the way we were we were um looking in looking at and doing that was to, like being selective of story of these personal stories that help also tell this larger story of the um incarceration experience right so we have examples of um 
of uh, uh, from you know children, right, uh, or people incarcerated who were children at the time. Um, we uh, a number of the examples that I think we showed were were those. Um, but if we only showed um, those examples of um, of uh, children's personal stories, you get a very specific, particular kind of um, uh, you know um, idea of the experience. Um, we we you know we also uh, uh, there was a story I didn't show it in the examples that I showed, but of a woman who lost her son, uh, who was um, who volunteered and, and served in the four hundred forty second. Um, and so, but you know, there are other there are other stories also. I think that in the future we would like to be able to tell. Um, one thing I I wanted to quickly mention, Dakota. I realized I didn't address the the broader uh, question that you had uh, earlier about technology and uh, and you know the the sort of implications of 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 using technology to interpret this. I just wanted to quickly um, mention that that I think you know on the one side, yeah, technology can you know, uh, can have issues um, and cannot work at certain times, but there's also big advantages too. And I think one of them is, um, you know, being able to interpret the site while still preserving and not having to build something new or somehow like physically impact the site, right? And I think that was a that was a, a, a really big consideration in doing this. And I think it's a, it's a big advantage also, right? You're not um, uh, if you just think about the cost and also the, um, you know, some of the uh, pitfalls of trying to kind of reconstruct things and make sure you, uh, you get that right. And, and in some cases, in some of these kinds of sites, um, I know with some of the underground railroad sites where we've done augmented reality apps, they're ongoing archaeological sites, right? So, um, so you want to kind of preserve uh, the integrity of those sites while still being able to interpret it. So I think that's, that was, um, you know, just to kind of um, touch on that. Fantastic, thanks. So tell me about uh, uh, sort of the, the narrative that you were, how you, your approach narrative within uh, the mission you ask in, Michelle. Um, I'll say, first of all, I think this theme of, you know, telling, a specific story, but trying to get at broader themes is, is definitely a challenge. And but it also it's sort of like a, a been kind of a guiding principle for us. Um, we always kind of come back to what are our broader educational and curriculum goals, and you know that kind of guides us in the very difficult choices we often have to make in in trying to figure out exactly what to include and what to cut. Um, I, I think in every single game we've done since the first game about the Boston Massacre, we've always started with a very ambitious scope of story that we want to tell. And it gets gradually whittled down as we start building the game and realize that we don't have the, the scope, um, both in terms of budget, but also in terms of gameplay time. We want to be able to convey um, the, the content in a way that's, you know, that provides enough you know, complexity and depth um, that we're not glossing over it. So we, we realize as we're building it, how much we can actually accomplish in a part. So like, for instance, for that Boston Massacre game, originally we were gonna go all the way to the Boston Tea Party and the war was gonna start and end, but we ended up just doing the Boston Massacre for the whole game at the end. Um, so for this game, originally we had wanted to actually take it through Minidoka when the Bainbridge Islanders would have ended up there at another camp. Um, and, you know, it just became, it, it, just for practical reasons, it became clear we wouldn't be able to actually, you know, build that site out and have an entire part there. Um, it does get mentioned in the, in the epilogue, um, but we really, you know, we knew, uh, we decided that really our priority is, was to focus on sort of these, these difficult choices um, that the Japanese Americans had to face and, you know, with the most difficult or one of the most difficult ones being that questionnaire. So we knew absolutely that needed to be sort of a culminating moment in the game. And that, you know, if we needed to kind of cut things or, or kind of condense and cut things after that, that, you know, that that would be, we would have to, and that would be okay because we'd still kind of get across this 
this larger theme about you know strategies for coping and and these these difficult decisions that the that the incarcerated had to make. Um, the other thing I will say is that we would love for Mission US to be a multi-character, multiplayer game where you could play different characters. Like that would be a, an amazing dream. You know, if you could play as Lily instead of as Henry, but that's way out of our budget right now. So, Wow, that would be really cool and really yeah. complicated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, guys, we're, we're reaching the end of our hour. I, I, I have folks who uh, still have questions out there. I'll, I'll ask you, John and Michelle, if you're comfortable, if folks want to reach out to you, um, drop in your email in the chat there um, okay. so that they can follow up. I know that we didn't get to everybody's questions uh, within this session. But, uh, you know, this was just amazingly enlightening and I, I walked away from it with so many big ideas floating around in my head and I hope that so many of our participants did as well. So I want to thank you both uh, for being part of this and uh, thank everyone for uh, attending as well. Uh, we look forward to a great rest of the conference. Uh, have a great day, everyone.